family. And if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 8. That's where we're going to be this morning. You know, when you talk about the subject of sex, it really has become a polarized issue in our society and our culture. Um, it can make a lot of people feel uncomfortable. My parents, man, they were sweating bullets when they had to talk to me about sex as a teenager. But I was a very inquisitive person. Unfortunately, I was sexually abused um, by an older cousin of mine uh, when I was a child, and so it really kind of opened up this gateway, really opened up this door to my body and the bodies around me, um, and I was really interested and intrigued by this. The first time I was exposed, uh, exposed to pornography, I was in the fifth grade. I actually was traveling to school. Uh, my parents let me walk. And I would stop by some of my fellow, you know, my friends' houses, and we would get together, uh, and then we would go on to school. And so the first time, fifth grade, walking to school, my friend invited me in, and he had porn on his computer. And it started a battle that day uh, that I would learn to walk with and live with, really, even up until today, because those images never fully leave your mind and those experiences that you have. Um, and a lot of people in this room have been exposed to pornography, uh, it's something that's becoming a cultural norm. The porn business is actually one of the largest grossing businesses in America. Billions and billions of dollars go into the porn industry, but unfortunately, a lot of the people that are in pornography are victims. A lot of them are doing it because they have to. A lot of them have been abused and manipulated or secretly recorded or whatever it is. The porn industry is huge, and it's ruined our culture. You know, for the longest time, the culture has told God to stay out of our schools, stay out of our bedrooms, stay out of our lives. And unfortunately, they told us as the church to stay out of the bedroom, but our culture is bringing the bedroom to the streets. You can't go anywhere without experiencing some overly sexualized, hyper-sexualized experience, whether that is in school or online or in movies or on our television. Like I said, the porn industry is a $13 billion industry. 24% of people that own a smartphone have looked at pornography on their phone. 64% of Christian men and almost 20% of Christian women struggle with pornography. That's out of four people, three of them have looked or have struggled with porn. People who describe themselves as fundamentalists, funnily enough, 91% of them look at pornography. 67% of young men and 49% of young women saying viewing porn is an ex uh, acceptable way to express your sexual identity. And I think that speaks of where the real problem has gone, is that we have viewed our identity more along the lines of our sexuality than anything else. For instance, when you go and you talk to somebody that, you know, is at a local party or somebody you're not really sure, a lot of people will say, well, what do you do? What's your line of work? Because a lot of people in our culture identify themselves as what they do, the job that they have. But in our culture, as you know, through commercials, just through online social media, really your sexual preference has now become who you are. And so now we're giving prescribed pronouns. You go to colleges, everybody's got their badges on, and you have to use your prescribed pronouns now. And if you don't use the prescribed pronoun, you're a bigot. You're somebody who is a, a, a person of hatred. And I think that's the unfortunate thing, is that we as the church, the Christian community as a whole, have really erred on the side of almost like we're happy that people are sinners, we're happy that people are going to hell, and so we spew vitriol hatred and condemnation, pointing the finger why we ourselves have been guilty of one of the worst sins of all as the church as a whole, and that's divorce. I think one of the biggest reasons why our culture is in such a moral sexual decay is because the church has lost its conviction and its accountability, that we stand back sometimes and we point the finger at everyone else and what they have going wrong, that we fail to take responsibility for ourselves. Yes, the divorce rate in the church is reaching now towards 60%, but yet we can look out into the world and demonstrate and show while everyone has it wrong and we have it right. You know, as we talk about this subject of sexuality or sexual identity or what the Bible says about sex, it's really important for us to not only approach it through the lens of love and compassion and grace, but also humility. I had somebody ask me who was uh, homosexual if they were allowed to come to church, and I said, well, absolutely. I said, if we banished everybody that was sexually immoral from the church, I'd be the only one left. <laughs> Which is not true. You got the joke. The reality is, is that we're, we're all guilty. We all fall short. 
I have sinned sexual uh, sins in my life, and I'm sure that I will continue to do it with my mind, but I don't want to. And I want to be a beacon of light, not only for my children, but for our community and for the people around me, because sexual sin is a different kind of sin, is what the Bible teaches. The U.S. Department of Justice, when they talked about pornography and sex uh, online, they said, never before in the history of telecommunications media in the United States has so much indecent and obscene material been so easily accessible by so many minors in so many American homes with so few restrictions. There is certainly a sexual assault in our culture, on our minds, in our communities, to our children. And we as Christians need to know what the Bible teaches and how we can honor God with our bodies and with who we are. You know, Jesus put it like this when it came to sexual sin. He says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that everyone who looks at a woman or a man with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so, yeah, maybe we haven't looked at porn. Maybe we've never cheated on our spouse. Maybe we've never fornicated. But the reality is, is that the sin of sexual sin starts in the heart and in the mind, and it gives birth in the body and the actions and what we do. You see, the problem with sexual sin is that it objectifies and it uses people. It disregards the other person as sacred. It says, you are not special. You are not unique. Your body is really not important, and I'm going to use it for my own personal gratification and my own personal means, whether that's through my own eyes and my own heart or whether that's actually through my body. The problem with our culture is that we have dishonored ourselves. We have dishonored who we are and what we are. You see, it comes as no surprise because our universities and even our high schools have pushed this worldview of Darwinian naturalism, which basically says the natural world, the material universe, is all you ever were, is all you ever are, and will always be what you are. In other words, there's nothing outside of this material universe. Your body is nothing more than a collection of molecules that have evolved over time, and so there's really no unique difference when it comes to you or the animal kingdom. You're just a part of this entire world. You're just a different kind of species. And when you degrade people as having unique and inherent special value created in the image of God, it's no wonder that we see this moral decay. It's no wonder that sexual sin has become exactly what naturalism says it is, just an outworking of our society. You know, people will often refer to the animal kingdom to describe human behavior, even in a sense to justify it. For instance, LGBT community, people that really do view themselves as attracted to the same sex or two different sexes at once, or even sincerely as transgender people suffer from gender dysphoria, um, view themselves as somebody opposite than what their body says that they are. There is a propaganda element to this. The idea, mainly, that there's really no scientific data to support same-sex attraction. In other words, they've done reviewed studies, they've done twin studies, they've looked at as much evidence as they possibly can, and there's really no biological determination for who you're attracted to. But yet, our society says something that's different. There's really no theological basis for same-sex attraction or transgenderism. Yet even in the Christian community, it has become something that you not only need to accept, but something that you need to endorse and promote. Well, what does the Bible teach about things like this? Are we more than just molecules in motion? Do we have inherent value? How should we as a Christian respond to this thing that we call sex or something like heterosexuality, homosexuality, transgenderism? How do we as a Christian honor God with our lives and with our bodies in an age where we are confused? One of my favorite stories in the Bible is found right here in John chapter 8. You see, in order to understand this passage, you have to understand the framework of how this passage is set. Israel was a nation who was dedicated to honoring God. That was their primary motive. And the reason why they were to be a nation dedicated towards honoring God with their bodies, with who they were, is because God ultimately wanted to bring about the Messiah to save the entire world. That was Israel's number one mission and reason for their existence. And so in John chapter 8, the Jews were celebrating. Well, guess what? 
The Jews didn't like Jesus for the most part, the Jewish leaders. They hated him. They couldn't stand who he was and what he stood for because they built their entire lives as Jewish leaders off of this superficial ideology that we are better than everyone else because we don't sin like them. And so they wanted to trap Jesus. And one of the ways that they tried to trap Jesus was to put him at odds with the people and put him at odds with Roman authorities, the Roman law. And so they grab a woman who's been caught in adultery. She's committing what's called a sexual sin, and it, it really is. And look at what John chapter 8, verse 2 says. It says, Early in the morning, he being Jesus, came into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down, and he began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. In other words, we have found someone who's broken the law of Israel. What are you going to do about it? You see, this is a sexual sin, committing adultery, which is having unlawful intercourse with somebody who's not your spouse. And so sexual immorality is a sin, ultimately, because it violates the sacred holiness and purpose that God intended for his creation to have. Look, if you start from the moral framework of naturalism, that this is all we ever have, and this is all we will ever be. Really, there's really nothing special about us. But if you start from the framework, what's called the teleological argument, that we are designed by God, we have unique inherent purpose and value, sexual sin ultimately gets away from that unique inherent purpose and value. Now look at this. Under the old law, adultery was punishable by death. They would stone a person caught in adultery. They wanted to protect the sexual integrity of Israel. And so they would drag people out into the streets if you were caught in adultery, and they would hit you with stones until you died. That's pretty, pretty tough, don't you think? I mean, look, they're dragging this woman before Jesus with stones in their hands, ready to carry out the old law. Now, this points to something that I think is obvious. There is a moral law at work that says you should not sleep with another person who does not belong to you, who is not yours. And that's the idea of sexual sin, is that we're going beyond the intended boundaries that God described. Look, sex is great. Sex is a gift to us from God. We were designed for sex, not only in procreation, but even in pleasure. There are parts of the body designed for us to enjoy having sex with who God created us to have sex with. But going outside the intended boundaries, the, in the intended purposes of God is where we get into trouble. And the Bible has a lot to say about sexual immorality. For instance, when Paul compares what it's like to live a life for God in the spirit and what it's like to live a life in the flesh, he says this in Galatians, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. He says, look, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this, those who habitually Actually practice sexual sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, how much sexual sin are we allowed to have? And isn't that what we do? We like to walk the line and get as close to the line as we possibly can without breaking the law so that we can stay within the, the realms of acceptability, enjoy our lives as, as much as what we can. Well, the Bible says we shouldn't even have a hint of sexual morality, not even a little drop. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 3. Five. He says, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because they are improper for God's holy people. And you can be sure of this, he says, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such as a person is an idolater and has the inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. We don't get to inherit the kingdom of God if we live a life of sexual sin. So the stakes are, are pretty high, wouldn't you say? And when it comes to our body, there's a lot more to this thing that we call sex than just your expression of who you are or your identity. There are eternal consequences at stake. Now, here's something that's very important. A lot of times we like to place sexual sin up on a pedestal as if it is a unique, separate, distinct sin in the sense that it's special. It's worse than all other sins, but it's not. There are different kinds of sexual sins. And sin breaks God's law just like lying or stealing. All sins will ultimately take you to the same place. 
which is separation from God. But not all sins are equal. And I think we would all be willing to grant that sexually abusing a child is a lot worse than stealing a pen that doesn't belong to you. All sins ultimately lead you to the same place, but all sins are not the same. They are not equal. They are different. For instance, there's adultery, cheating on your spouse sexually, fornication. It's any form of sexual intercourse outside of marriage. That could be uh, young people, teenagers, It could be older adults who are no longer married. To fornicate simply means to have sex outside of marriage. There's homosexuality the Bible talks about. And it talks about being attracted to somebody who's the same sex as you. And it's sexual intercourse with that person. There's bestiality, sex with animals. And then, of course, there's pornography. It's actually where we get the word um, sexual morality from. It comes from the Greek word pornos, where the word pornography comes from. It means to have sexual pleasure through images or videos, nightclubs, movies, magazines, or anything like that, to lust in your heart after this. Now, here's the, here's the standard. The standard is honoring God with who we are. And sexual immorality is painstakingly sinful. And here's the reason. is because it's a sin against your very own body. And the Bible says you are joined with Jesus. And so there's something unique that does take place through sexual sin. You know, when it comes to marriage, here this woman is caught in the act of adultery. She's having sexual relations with a man who is not her spouse. And she's dragged before Jesus. And there, without a shadow of a doubt, she's at fault. Now, I have compassion on her because I've sinned sexually. I've never cheated on my spouse. My spouse has never cheated on me, so I don't have that experientially, but I know what it's like to break God's law. I know what it's like to mess up and fall short and hate myself for it and promise God that I'll never do it again, and the next day I turn right back around and I do it again. But God is calling us to a standard. He's calling us to honor each other. Look what Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, marriage is to be held in honor among all and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. Fornicate, pornos, sex outside of marriage, adultery, unlawful intercourse with somebody who's not your spouse. At the end of the day, the key idea and the focus is sexual purity is our honor code to the Lord. We honor God by being sexually pure. Now sexual purity isn't virginity. You can lose your virginity to your spouse and still be sexually pure. Sex is not a dirty word. You guys are already like, man, we're sweating. This is uncomfortable. I don't like this. But here's here's what's at stake is our eternal relationship with God and our ability to honor him in this life. And I don't know about you, but as a Christian, I want to honor God. And this woman who's caught in the act of adultery, I think she wants to honor God. But she's messed up and made mistakes just like you and I. Look at what happens in John chapter 8, verse 5. It says, now in the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such women. Well, what do you say, Jesus? Here's the trap. The Mosaic law commanded them to stone women and men caught in adultery. But only the Romans were allowed to put people to death. And so if Jesus would have said, yeah, let's stone the lady. I mean, she's guilty after all. He would have been at odds with the Roman authorities. This was the trap. But if he says, don't stone her, then he's at odds with the people because he's breaking Mosaic law. And so in verse 6, it says, they were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, and he wrote on the ground. You know, they're trying to trap Jesus. Moral decay has set in in Israel. They're not stoning people for breaking the Mosaic law at this time. They have really kind of dropped that off because only Romans were allowed to execute the death penalty. John the Baptist came along, preparing the way for the Lord, telling people, get back in line with the old covenant. And so in their attempt to trap Jesus, Jesus reverses it and turns the trap right back on them. And you know what? Our culture really is trying to trap us as the church. Stay out of the bedroom, church. You have no right to tell us what goes on behind closed doors. Well, that's not true. Abusing children, I have the right to stand up for children behind closed doors. Bestiality is another sexual sin that people do against animals. We have the right to stand up against that. Well, you ought not discriminate. Well, why are you discriminating against me? Can you discriminate against somebody who's discriminatory? Isn't that discrimination in and of itself? In other words, we all draw the line somewhere. As a Christian, we are called to compassionately draw the line according to God's word and without hypocrisy. We're called to love others as God has loved us. We're called to grant others the same forgiveness that God has granted us. 
And so in this American culture now, acceptance and tolerance really means to condone and promote. And if you don't condone and promote it, well, then you're a bigot. You know, in the 1970s and even up until 2012, there are certain sexual acts like homosexuality or lesbianism or even transgenderism in 2012 was diagnosed as a mental disorder. It means there's something wrong in the chemical structure of your brain that's causing you to act out in an unnatural way. And even though I've read and looked for really good scientific reasons why that should have been reversed, I simply haven't found it. And so, in my opinion... It's really because of propaganda, cultural influence. Now, I'm not sitting back pointing the finger at anybody else because I'm a raging heterosexual. I lust in my mind and in my heart, and there is no sexual difference in the sense of sin of me and somebody who's a homosexual. And so I stand with everyone else under condemnation of God as somebody who has sexually sinned before. But that doesn't mean we still shouldn't stand on the principles of God's word and fight for the same moral truth that the Bible fights for. And so in this idea of tolerance or in this idea of acceptance, the idea is if you don't promote it, you're a bigot. And so they have declassified these things that have been traditionally classified as mental disorders. And now the person who speaks out against it has the mental disorder. Well, you're homophobic. You're transphobic. Phobias are mental disorders. And so we have this cultural reversal to where now things that are unnatural are natural. Things that are no longer mentally disordered are now mentally disordered. And so we have created this firestorm of hate and contention. We've lost the ability to disagree with one another compassionately, and it's certainly coming to a head. Now I say this, as I said before, divorce in the church is worse now than it ever has been. But we shouldn't say just because divorce is worse in the church now that it ever has been, that means divorce doesn't work, or that means marriage doesn't work. And it isn't good. It is logically false. It is correlation without causation. Marriage is good, but it's not what you're called to be. People say, well, look, I'm not attracted to opposite sex or same sex. Well, that's okay. Our church cultures created this idea that unless you get married, you're falling short of what God has planned for you. Well, some people are eunuchs for the kingdom of God. Being alone isn't a bad thing. Being single isn't a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with being a single young adult. There's nothing wrong with not getting married. Guess who wasn't married in the Bible? Jesus. The Apostle Paul, the one who wrote this, this, this book that we read in, we call the Bible. These guys were unmarried, but yet lived such fulfilled, gratifying, God-honoring lives. They honored God with their bodies because their identity and who they were wasn't wrapped up in what they were. It wasn't wrapped up in their sexual identity. Well, people say, well, marriage only complicates things. We're happy now. Why in the world should we get married and get unhappy? <laughs> well, that's not fair. Marriage is tough at times. But some of the most happy people in the world, by clinical research, are those who are married in a trusting, mutual relationship. You know, usually I hear it from male partners the most, not to pick on the guys. But look, marriage is meant to secure the commitment of both partners. It protects both partners. After experiencing watching, not experiencing myself, but after watching my wife go through childbirth, dudes, we have it easy. <laughs> Come on now, we really do. Like women, oh my goodness, holy cow, it's just not fair. I mean, I, I think a lot of ladies are going to get up to heaven and ask God, God, why did you make this so unfair? <laughs> but it's true. I mean, monthly menstrual cycles, they have to bear children. I mean, we're talking about not an easy process to undergo. I have so much more respect for women. Now, not that I didn't have respect for them, but watching my child give birth to two children, wow. <laughs> Pain tolerance is high, the ability to cope and manage. I mean, it truly is remarkable, but we're not here to talk about pregnancy. But here's the point. Women often go through things that men don't. And women often assume roles in our culture that men don't. And men don't have to deal with certain things that women have to deal with. And so the idea of marriage protects the person. It doesn't control or hurt. It's for protection under this idea. Well, what if we say, well, look, I need to test drive it before I buy it. And that's the problem. Dishonors the other person. What's more important, my sexual satisfaction or our marriage and our relationship? You know, the Bible says you become one with a person when you have sex with them. And an intimate attachment takes place. 
And then to rip that apart just because you don't remain sexually satisfied is one of the most dishonorable, selfish things that we can do, but it's what our culture propagates and teaches. We, our culture says virginity is not a gift, and you shouldn't entrust it to anyone else that it's something for you to control and you to explore, and you do whatever you want, and there's really no sacredness in being a virgin anymore. You see, sex is a sacred gift from God, and we cannot and we should not try to take marriage and remove the honor from it. Well, how about this? Sex is no big deal. Don't make it more than what it is. Well, that dishonors yourself. It says that I'm not unique. I have no value. My body isn't special. It's to be selfish. It's to numb yourself to the unique image that God created you to be. To say that sex is no big deal is really at the end of the day to say God is no big deal. His image doesn't matter. Now, there was a problem at the church in Corinth. So I'd like to deviate from Romans chapter 8, and I'd like for you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The church at Corinth's got a problem. The first problem is they've rejected the authority of the apostle Paul. And so Paul's writing to the church at Corinth to remind them of what he taught, but also to establish his apostolic authority. Look, I'm speaking on behalf of God, and I've proved it to you, in other words. Well, the church at Corinth has a big sex issue. They had a temple there that was dedicated to the sex goddess, and one of the ways that they would worship the sex goddess is they would go into the temple, and they would undergo something called prostitution. They would have sexual intercourse with temple slaves. And often men would look like women, for homosexual acts, and women would shave their heads and look like men in order to assume a certain gender role. And so it was a complete mess. In fact, the church at Corinth took the grace of God to such an extreme that they said, look, now that we're forgiven, we are at liberty to do whatever we want. And that includes having sex with whoever we want. And so Paul has to write to them some pretty hard things to accept and understand. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, one young man has actually had sexual intercourse with his mother-in-law. And Paul says, this is unacceptable living. You have inherent value. You were created with a purpose. And so they had this argument and this idea. We are liberty. We are free. We have the ability to do whatever we want because God's grace has given it to us. And Paul says, oh no, you were created for a purpose. Christian liberty does not give you the freedom to express yourself in any way that you want. And so they had this argument, look, you know how food is designed for the stomach? Well, what are our sexual bodies designed for? Sex. Therefore, because food is designed for the stomach, and so we eat whatever we want, so our, sex is, our, our bodies are designed for sex, and so we should have sex with whoever we want. And Paul's going to give us several good reasons why we should honor God with our bodies. Look at verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 9. Paul says, look, just like he did in Galatians and Ephesians, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And so don't be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor the homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul lays down the line and he says, look, if you live a lifestyle of sin, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he's writing to the church. But guess what homosexuality is mentioned right along with? Prostitution, people who swindle other people, people who lie and cheat and are obsessed with greed. And sometimes the church culture likes to point out homosexuality or lesbianism or transgenderism as some special sin different than the rest. And Paul says, oh no, all equally will get you to the same place. I think one of the most important things we as the church can do is to take responsibility for our actions, for our heterosexual sins, for our broken marriages, to fix ourselves, and then we're able to see clearly to help change the world. And so we can't view homosexuality as some outside sin that's special. No, it is a sin. It deviates from God's design and intention and plan for our life. But ultimately, Paul says, this is what some of you were, he goes on to say, but you were washed you are sanctified. You're different now. You've been set apart. You're saved. This is what you were. And so the first reason why we should honor God with our bodies is because habitual sexual sin prevents us from inheriting the kingdom of God. That's a pretty good reason. Look, if you are a raging heterosexual who's having sex with somebody other than your spouse, that's going to take you to the same place as homosexuality. Both need to be stopped. Well, there's another reason Paul says we should honor God with our bodies. And it's this, 
He appeals to this design argument. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, food is for the stomach and stomach is for the food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. In other words, the body is sacred. It has dignity. Our bodies matter. Your body is designed by God for a purpose and a reason. Our bodies are for the Lord. Well, then he advances advances a third argument. It's not just our bodies are designed for the Lord, but our bodies will live in eternity. We will be resurrected in the new life to live in a new heavens and a new earth. And the Greeks, they had this philosophical dualistic view of the person where the spirit was good and the body was bad. And they really dealt with this idea in two different ways. The first way was to void yourself of all pleasure and ascend. Detach yourself from food and sexual pleasure so that you can release your spirit into freedom. Well, the other idea was this. You can do whatever you want with your body. Your body, your choice. But look, if God exists, which he does, and Jesus resurrected from the dead, which he did, and the Bible's trustworthy, which it is, what Jesus and the Bible says about who we are and what we're designed for matters, and it reflects truth. And so Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 6, 14, now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. And so he's advancing several reasons why we should honor God with our bodies. First of all, if we dishonor our bodies, we won't inherit the kingdom of God. Second of all, uh, we are designed for a purpose. Third of all, eternal implications are at stake. But the fourth reason why we should honor God with our bodies is this. We are united with Christ as a Christian. And this is probably one of the ones that I struggle to wrap my mind around the most. He says this, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall then I take away the member of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one with her in body? There's a special union that takes place, in other words. For he says the two shall become one flesh. He appeals to the creation account in Genesis. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Do you want a really good reason why you should honor God with your body as a Christian? It's because Jesus lives in you. You're one with him. And we shouldn't join our bodies with something that falls below the standard and design that God intends for us to have. Paul gives us another reason. Sexual sin against the body is a unique sin against the body. If we pick up a pencil that's not ours or take some food that's not ours, that's one thing. But Paul says, look, sexual sin is unique in the sense that it's a sin against your own body and you are special. You have value. You have worth. He says in verse 16, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. You have a glorious future. Your body is going to be resurrected one day, and Jesus lives inside of you is what Paul's saying. And every time you give yourself away to prostitution or sexual sin, you're joining Jesus with something that falls below his own standard and his own design. Well, he gives us another reason. In verse 19, he says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, for whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And then look what he says in verse 20. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Do you want another final really good reason why you should honor God with your body? You're not your own. In fact, God was willing to die rather than be without you. That's how special and unique you are. That's how precious your body is, that God was willing to die by sending his own son to purchase you. You've been bought. You are not your own. It cost God the sacrifice of his own son to purchase you. Here's the question. Do you honor that purchase? Do you honor that sacrifice? We are living in a culture of moral decay that has completely removed the honor of who we are and our sex and our created purpose and design for our body. How are we supposed to respond? Honor God with who you are and what you are. If God exists, which he does, And Jesus resurrected from the dead, which he did. And what the Bible says about Jesus is true, which it is. We can follow God's plan for honoring 
who we are, both heterosexuality, homosexuality, both those who suffer from gender dysphoria and lesbianism. We are all called to the same moral honor code, to honor God with our bodies. You know, let's end with this story of this woman dragged before Jesus. Remember, we ended with him drawing a line in the sand. He doesn't stone her, but he doesn't rebuke and revoke the Mosaic law. Well, what does he do? Look what it says here in John chapter 8, verse 7. It says, but when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Isn't that true? Well, he's a homosexual. Okay. You're heterosexual, right? Yeah. Are you sexually pure? No. Well, what's the difference? Well, she's a lesbian. Okay. Didn't God die for her just like he did for you? Yeah. Who wants to cast the first stone? Who wants to judge themselves? Who wants to revoke the grace of God that he's given to me and to you by forgiving us of our own sexual sin? Now, it's not to condone a male who has sex with 100 women a year. That's certainly not what we want to do. Nor is it to condone somebody who practices homosexual behavior. What is it? What's the point? We are forgiven, and we are called to honor God with our bodies. And so Jesus rebukes the leaders of the law, and he draws a line in the sand, and he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. If there's anybody that can speak to us about sexuality, it's Jesus. He was perfect. He was sinless. If there's anybody that's willing to condemn us and has the right to do so, it is Jesus. It's God. But he offers us forgiveness. He offers us hope. You know, I would not want gender dysphoria or transgenderism wished upon my worst enemy. To be in a body that you genuinely feel is not your own, that would be, that would be a very difficult challenge, would it not? To be somebody who is attracted to somebody of the same sex I can't imagine what that's like, but I do know what it's like to lust in my heart. I do know what it's like to commit sexual sin in and of myself, and I do know what it's like to experience the grace of God. And I find myself dropping my own stone while I try to glorify God with my body. How do we deal with this cultural issue? Truth and grace. Speaking the truth in love and pointing to the gospel that ultimately saves. So it goes on to say this, And he stooped down to the ground, and he wrote. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, and the woman, where she was, in the center of the court. You know why the older ones dropped their stones first? It's because they knew. They knew. Those who give the most compassion have received and understood compassion in and of themselves. And those who are filled with hatred and animosity have not experienced the grace of God. They're too full of hatred of themselves to do that. Those of us who are wise will drop our stones, but here's what we're called to. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you either, but here's the point. Go, and from now on, sin no more. You know, I don't know where you're at this morning or what you've struggled with or what you are struggling with. I don't know if you're a husband and a father that's addicted to pornography and you can't break it. I don't know if you're a single adult that's struggling with uh, homosexuality or lesbianism. I don't know if you are somebody who's even experiencing gender dysphoria and you are questioning who you are and what you are. But here's what I do know. God gives us hope. And he calls us to himself. And if calling us to himself means we live a life of abstinence and singleness, then so be it and praise God because Jesus was single and abstinent. If God is calling us to honor our marriage and not defile the marriage bed, then praise God. Let us honor our bodies and our marriage. If God is calling us to himself and a relationship with himself, we know that there is hope because we have compassion and grace. And that is really, really good news. But go and sin no more. You know, I often think about what Jesus wrote on the ground. Have you ever asked yourself that question? I wonder what he wrote. And as this woman is standing there before him and these Pharisees and these legal scholars are wanting Jesus to entrap himself, I can imagine myself standing before Jesus and he writes on the ground, not guilty. You are 
loved. And it speaks truth to us. And it speaks hope to us. And it speaks compassion to us. And that's the message that we should be sharing with the people around us. I want you to know that if you've messed up sexually, you're in good company. That most of us have. But God's willing to forgive you and give you grace. And he's not calling you to be perfect, but he is calling you to be faithful. Let's stand and let's pray.